For 150 years, St. John's Church has provided a sanctuary to the citizens of Gloucester and Cape Ann, and also for hundreds of itinerant fishermen working the cod banks between here and the Canadian Maritimes. They have used it as a place of worship. They have found joy in countless weddings and baptisms, but they have also suffered through hundreds of funerals made necessary by no less than nine wars, and this being Gloucester, have had to endure the relentless loss at sea. As we celebrate this anniversary and reflect on St. John's history, we renew our commitment to Cape Ann and remember the many dedicated people whom over all these years have kept this place and its vital mission alive. Hello and welcome to St. John's Episcopal Church's 150th anniversary film. We're making this film to show you the history of the parish, some of the characters and events that made it what it is today. In this part of the film, we'll show you how St. John's was founded as a direct result of the Oxford Movement. That movement led to the founding of the Church of the Advent in Boston, and many people from that church decided to found a church in Gloucester to meet the spiritual needs of the underprivileged fishing community here. But first, we want you to imagine Gloucester in colonial times. St. John's is an Episcopal Church of the Diocese of Massachusetts, itself bound to the Anglican Communion, the Church of England, a relationship that goes back to colonial times. When the Massachusetts Bay Colony came here nearly 400 years ago, there were tensions between the Anglican Loyalists seeking business opportunities in the New World and Separatists seeking religious freedom. The Separatists were trying to escape the Church of England, which by this time had abandoned the middle and lower classes and become essentially the church of the ruling class. As the state church of England, its powers were legally enforced. Several Anglicans were banished from Plymouth Plantation in 1625 for undermining the separatists and came up to Cape Ann to try and help pull together a small encampment of fishermen. Among them was the renegade minister John Lyford, he is most likely the reason that the first English-speaking religious services on Cape Ann were Anglican. They were conducted here at Stage Fort Park in what was formerly known as Fisherman's Field. The settlement fell apart when the investors withdrew their support. However, due to Cape Ann's abundant resources of fish and timber, the seeds of a town were planted. In 1642, when the town of Gloucester was founded, it wasn't located on the harbor, which was deemed too dangerous due to French marauders and pirates. Gloucester was first settled where most of us come into town today. Off the Route 128 bridge at Grant Circle, the site of the first town green. The people survived by farming and by selling firewood to Boston. It took another 90 years for the British Navy to gradually beat back the French in the Maritimes, and this enabled Gloucester's population to move down to the present harbor. After that, the town prospered from a mixture of fishing, coastal shipping, and transatlantic trade. Church services were held in town meeting houses, which were never religiously consecrated. In 1738, the first parish meeting house was built on Cornhill Street, which we now know as Middle Street, at the current site of the synagogue. Ultimately, six houses of worship would inhabit Middle Street. Eventually, the State Church of England was not to survive here, being mostly made up of loyalists who ended up on the losing side of our successful American Revolution. The Anglican Church, symbolic of the authority of King George, was stripped of both clergy and financial support 
as over 50,000 of these loyalists headed to Canada. However, Anglicans remained who were committed to the new country, but favored the Book of Common Prayer, the Psalms, and the music they had been brought up with. A group met in Philadelphia in the 1780s and revised the prayer book by stripping out all the references to King George. The Protestant Episcopal Church was born. In the early days of the 19th century, the Episcopal Church service was totally different from what we experience today. Most Episcopal churches were outwardly very similar to Presbyterian-style churches. The usual worship service on a Sunday morning was morning prayer, and the focus and emphasis was very heavily on the Word, the Scriptures, and on the sermon as the high point of the service. The Holy Eucharist would have been celebrated perhaps four times per year. And the theology was also quite similar. It was the Calvinistic or Reformed theology uh, predominantly. Then the Oxford movement, which was gaining traction in England, got a toehold in the United States as well. Young men at Oxford University were disgusted with the rigid, militaristic, legally enforced orthodoxy of the Church of England. It had no aesthetic appeal, and what was worse was that it had no methods of serving the suffering lower classes in the mill towns. They thought that performing an aesthetically impressive liturgy would at least provide a contrast to the drabness found in the daily lives of the poor. The Oxford movement was a reevaluation of the nature of Anglicanism, seeing it as more Catholic than Protestant in its identity and heritage, emphasizing the continuity between Anglicanism and the medieval Roman Catholic Church. At first this was expressed primarily through theology and arguments about the essence or nature of the church, but then the next generation of people in this movement, uh, known as the Ritualists, decided to put the reform into practice in the manner of worship. And so a very different sort of liturgical experience was created, one that was modeled on the rituals and rites of the medieval Roman Catholic Church. With the Industrial Revolution in full swing, debates on just wages, infant mortality, and working conditions stemmed partly from the Oxford movement. These ideas were, of course, highly controversial on both sides of the Atlantic. In England, the Oxfords were accused of attempting to strip away the very identity of the Church of England. In Massachusetts, Episcopal Bishop Manton Eastburn favored the traditional rigid forms of the established church, but younger men were looking for new means of religious expression. Ultimately, the genuine pastoral concern for the impoverished made church relevant again to these young supporters, energizing the Oxford movement's advocates in the United States, especially in Boston. These new ideas were the catalyst for a radical new kind of Episcopal church, the Church of the Advent, on Beacon Hill. Designed as a free church to serve the poor, it was furnished with an altar cross, candles, and flowers. Manton Eastburn, who was the Bishop of Massachusetts, first came to the Church of the Advent um, for a visitation he saw candles and a cross on the altar, and he was so outraged, he told the then rector that he would never come back unless those were removed. His action led to the canonical requirement that bishops visit all parishes at least once in three years. The Advent's founders had another radical idea. They were against the widespread custom of renting pews. 
In those days, people with means leased the best seats in church from generation to generation. The servants and the poor were relegated to places in the back or in the galleries. Pew rents provided incomes for churches, but also effectively excluded those who could not afford them. The Advent's Charter speaks of the need to secure the benefits of the gospel to the poor and needy in a manner free from unnecessary expense in all ungracious circumstances. By the advent of the Civil War, a few key Episcopal philanthropists were dedicating their time and resources to serve the common seamen in Boston, and these same men saw the need to establish a free parish in Gloucester. The most important of these were brothers William and Theron Dale and Richard Henry Dana, Jr. The Dales were the sons of Dr. Ebenezer Dale who had come to Gloucester shortly before the War of 1812 and settled as the town's beloved physician. His eldest son, William, was also a physician, later becoming the Surgeon General for Massachusetts during the Civil War. Theron Johnsondale, the youngest of the brothers, ran Dale Brothers and Company, a successful woolen and cotton dealer. They both lived in Boston, but shared a summer house on Freshwater Cove. Richard Henry Dana was a lawyer who had spent two years serving at sea before the mast. The book he wrote of his experiences became a bestseller. He had great sympathy for the common mariner and did everything he could to make their lives better. These men were all members of the Church of the Advent. Their idea for Gloucester was modeled after St. Mary's Free Church for Sailors in Boston's North End a pet project of Dana's. Its rector was James Parker Robinson, who had a zealous young son-in-law from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Joshua Ringe Pierce. Therendale thought Joshua would make the perfect rector for their proposed Gloucester Free Parish. Although services were held in private homes in Gloucester, it was not until 1861 that an Episcopal society formed to hold services. This small group met in Magnolia Hall, a building at 48 Middle Street, which had formerly housed an academy for special learning. After this academy failed, the Universalists next door kept the building for 20 years, renting to various schoolmasters, visiting lecturers, and itinerant training experts. The Episcopal Society used this as a meeting place for their first year, and then Theron Dale persuaded the owners to move the building and sell him the cellar hole for the future church. Magnolia Hall was lifted, cut into two pieces, and moved by ox cart to where we can see it today. One piece here at 52 Washington Street. And one here at 6 Orchard Street. In 1863, Dale purchased the cellar hole, securing a permanent location for what would be St. John's. From the earliest parish record, a book that still exists today at St. John's, we can explore the formal organization of the parish in 1863. On March 7th, the record dictates instructions to Charles Thompson, a member of the society and one of the most respected lawyers in Gloucester. It says, The legal voters of the Episcopal Society, worshiping in Magnolia Hall in Gloucester, request you to call a meeting of the legal voters, to be held in said hall on Friday the 15th day of May, 1863, for the purpose of organizing a parish in accordance with the canons and regulations of the Protestant Episcopal Church. Thompson ordered a warrant posted calling the meeting with the purpose of electing officers. At the meeting on May 15th, William Babson was chosen moderator, John Stacy and Henry Merchant, wardens, and F.K. Woodbury, who would later serve as organist, to serve as temporary clerk. Later that year, on October 7th, 
the Reverend Joshua Pierce submitted the report of the committee, and it was voted that the society be renamed St. John's Church after Pierce's home church in Portsmouth. The group accepted the Constitution, and it was voted that Pierce continued to serve as rector. The first record book also includes the handwritten Constitution approved that day. It says, The name of this corporation shall be the Rector, Wardens, and Vestry of St. John's Church in the town of Gloucester. Its doctrine, discipline, and worship shall be that of the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States of America and no other, and as one of the parishes thereof, it accedes to the constitutions and canons of the Diocese of Massachusetts. The following year, on May 26, 1864, it was agreed that a building be erected. Architect Alexander Esty of Boston designed a simple wooden board and batten structure. Edward Hoyt and Isaac Andrews of Gloucester erected the structure on the cellar hall at 48 Middle Street. The final cost was $4,150. The Boston Evening Transcript on September 9th describes St. John's as a neat Gothic edifice with an ornamented front window of stained glass and stained glass chancel windows. It also said a fine organ costing $1,000 is to be built in Boston. When St. John's was completed a few weeks later, it was announced in the Gloucester Telegraph that the congregation would replace it with a stone church in the Gothic style as soon as possible. The church started with a good congregation, a fine choir, and an organist, and within four years over a hundred families were attending. <laughs>